Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is another edition of Answers, Special Education in the Age of the COVID-19 Era. I'm your host, Kevin Daly. We'll start with a PowerPoint. In this edition of Answers, there is going to be an update on the latest information about schools and school closings. There will be a segment on Mani School by Audra Talbot. Followed by that will be my interview with my special guest for today, Brian Klinkowitz, who is the Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Special Education at the State Department of Public Education. And as always, there will be time for question and answers with participants. We're going to do it by text this time, so if you have a question for any of the three of us, please put it in writing and send it off. Before I continue, I should mention that this web webinar is brought to you by PATH, Parent to Parent, Family Voices of Connecticut. Parent, PATH is a nonprofit organization that for over 30 years has served the needs of families that have children with special health care needs. For more information about PATH, please check out their website at pathct.org. And if you have any questions about today's webinar, or about PATH, please feel free to call me, uh, to email me at this email address that you see in front of you. So a word about this webinar. Uh, the content of this webinar is not to be taken as legal advice or as healthcare advice. It's coming from me, Kevin Daly. I'm a special education parent advocate, and I have been for 22 years. And like many people during the last month, I've been looking for answers. That's what this webinar is all about. So here's the school update for April 14th, 2020. <clears throat> As we all know by executive order uh, by our governor, Ned Lamont, all public schools are closed until April 20th. This affects about half a million Connecticut public school students and out of that half million, 70,000 are special education students. Also by executive order, the 180 day rule has been suspended. This is the rule that requires school districts to offer no less than 180 full days of school in a given school year. That rule has been suspended. Schools will close <clears throat> on their normally scheduled end dates or later, but not before, oddly enough. Also by executive order, the last day of school, as it always is, will be no later than June 30th. More executive order. District-wide testing has been suspended for the rest of the school year. This is the testing that students take several times a year to measure their proficiency in basic learning skills, reading, writing, math. The soonest that will happen now will be fall of 2020. And this is a request that the governor could not make without approval by the US Department of Education. They did, and so the governor issued the order. During this crisis, there has been lots of guidance from the Connecticut State Department of Education. Let's take a look at some of it. According to the State Department of Ed, they're urging school districts to provide continued educational opportunities, also known as distance learning, while the schools are closed. The idea is to ensure that special education students have access to learning and the schools need to make sure that special education students and students with disabilities have access to these opportunities. According to the SDE, the distance learning days are not considered school days. They're considered continued educational opportunities, a learning day. That's important and a lot of things pivot because of that fact. Special education evaluations are suspended by the Bureau and timelines that involve a number of school days are suspended. School districts are asked to maintain consistent communication with parents during these learning days, and parents should be able to provide feedback too. So what we're looking at is two-way communication. There should be two-way communication between school and home during this time. And if there isn't, it's a good idea to try and get it by calling the school or sending an email. So how does all this affect special education students? Well, until the schools reopen, no special education, <clears throat> not as we knew it before, a month ago, no PPT meetings, unless both parties agree to it, no special education evaluations, and worst of all, no opportunities for parents to be involved in the decision-making process around their children. As the legendary comic Jimmy Durante would say, those are some big no's. 
There is a sign of hope among all this, something that I came across that came from OSERS, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services with the U.S. Department of Education. According to OSERS, a guidance that was released on March 21st about when schools resume normal operations, way many steps from now, IEP teams must make an individualized determination whether and to what extent compensatory services may be needed. The, the key to this here is compensatory services. I haven't heard administrators or policymakers talk about that, at least not until now. What it says to me, and this, this is my interpretation, folks, PPT meetings are going to be held someday. <laughs> We're going to go back to PPT meetings. And when we do, the meeting will assess the impact of the school closures on each student with a disability. And when we have our day again, when we go back to PPT, PPT teams will need to develop appropriate compens compensatory services based on a student's individual needs. As parents, we need to start preparing for that day when we go to PPT again and have faith that day will come. In other news, the CARES Act was passed a couple of weeks ago. This is the nation's stimulus program that was in the news so much. A part of this CARES Act helps get more money into schools. What it does is it helps avoid laying off educators. It helps laying off hourly workers, the paraprofessionals, the uh, non-certified staff. They're all important and if schools lose these people, then it's going to be a big disadvantage. Also under the CARES Act, the CARES Act directs, directs the Department of Education to provide Congress with a list of waivers that will be needed to implement IDEA. So what is a waiver? According to Merriam-Webster Online, the definition of a waiver is the act of intentionally relinquishing or abandoning a known right, claim, or privilege or the legal instrument evidencing such an act. So these waivers on IDEA that they're talking about, they're going to be a legal instrument that will be used to intentionally relinquish or abandon our kids' rights. I know parents who have a problem with that and I'm uncomfortable with it too. Very uncomfortable. What's going to happen out of this? You know, as Americans, we're known for giving up our rights in times of crisis. If you don't believe me, Google the Patriot Act. And there's so many unanswered questions. How far will these waivers go to free school districts from their legal obligations to our children? We don't know. We haven't seen the waivers. Will this temporary crisis be used to make permanent reductions to special education? Folks, there are a lot of fo a lot of people inside the Washington D.C. Beltway who don't support special education. Some of them don't even support public education. It wasn't that long ago there were conversations about doing away with the U U.S. Department of Education, and these folks are going to be in charge of approving waivers once the Department of Education recommends them. Another question is, or Will the waivers be reasonable, considering, considering the extent of the crisis? Or will they provide the flexibility schools need to get back to business as quickly and efficiently as possible? We don't know. We don't know because we haven't seen the waivers yet. We will know when we see the waivers, but we're not at that point yet. So folks, I would like to suggest that until we see what we're dealing with, we take the advice that I often give my clients, don't reach for the panic button until it's absolutely necessary, and I don't think we're at that point yet. What we should do is what the great American author James Thurber suggested. Don't look back in anger, don't look forward in fear, but look around with awareness. It's important for us to do that, to ask questions, to get answers, and see where we're going. We need to be like the Minutemen of the American Revolution. We go about our business, but we're all always watching, always looking for potential threats, always ready to rise up if necessary. That is what we need to do as parents. I'd like to point out that in this case, the computer keyboard is mightier than the rifle, 
And what we need to do is make our legislators in Washington, D.C. know how we feel about these waivers once we get to see them. We don't, haven't seen the waivers yet, but that will be the focus, our Washington, D.C. legislators. IDEA is a federal law, and only Congress can address changes to federal law. On the next edition of Answers, I'm going to give you more answers about the waivers. If the waivers are out, I will provide an in-depth analysis on April 21st. On the April 21st edition of Answers, my guest will be Adrian Smaller, clinical psychologist. And Dr. Smaller is a clinical, clinical psychologist. She has been for more than 25 years. She has a private practice in Madison. She's also on the faculty of the Yale Child Study Center. And now it's that point in the webinar where I turn things over to Audra Talbot for Mommy School. Audra, take it away. Hi, Kevin, thank you. So my name is Audra Talbot. I'm the mother of two children in the special education system here in Bristol, and I'm also a special education advocate here in Connecticut. And I work in the whole state of Connecticut except for my hometown in Bristol. So there's been a lot of questions lately about PPT meetings, and I saw some pop up as Kevin was talking about uh, the waivers. So I wanna to try to address that. And if there's any side questions, please put them in the chat, and we'll try our best to get to those tonight. But I hope we can meet needs um, with some of our answers. So to PPT or not to PPT, that is the question. Next. So the goal, the goal of Mommy School is to address your feelings of helplessness and hopelessness by giving you a sense of empowerment. And I think that's very important in the time right now, is that you need to feel empowered by information. And knowledge brings confidence, and the confidence you get is your empowerment. Next slide. So in case you don't know, a PPT meeting is a parent placement team meeting. I think the majority of us on this call know what that is because we're all somehow related to the special ed world or have had a PPT meeting. You have the right to a PPT meeting as a parent or guardian. And I put some law down in there to help describe it for you if you need a better definition. But I think the most important part of that is you, um, the third line, participate equally in the decision-making process. That's really the most important thing, I think, when we look at if you should have a PPT meeting or not. So the next slide. So the, the Thousand dollar question. Can I ask for one even if the school is closed? Yes. Yes, you can. And you are the first member of the team and a subject matter expert on your child. And never, ever. You have the right to participate equally, as it says right there in the previous slide in the law. And then below is the idea law. The parents are the first member of the, the team. Next slide. So what do you do? What do you do if you ask and they say no? Well, I want you to request that in an email or in writing. I prefer email because it's time stamped and it's digital. It's automatically part of the school record to the case manager. I think you should start there at the case manager. If that gets denied for your request to have a PPT meeting because your district is not having PPT meetings because of the guidance that came out, then I want you to go up the chain, go up the food chain, go to the supervisor. And if that doesn't work, then you go to the director. But you document everything along the way. I think one of the most important things is, this is your perspective as a parent. This PPT meeting is important to you, and having one is part of the decision-making process. It's an equal decision. So you have to explain why you require this meeting, why it's important, and how it will benefit your child. Next slide. So what do you do if you say yes? Well, first of all, you celebrate that, because it's a, really, it's a win. You request in an email, just like every other request that you do when pertaining to school requests to the case manager. Again, start with the case manager. And also, you know, I think some families have the accessibility issue, but you wanna make sure that you have the technical requirements in order to have a virtual PPT meeting. Because if you don't, then I want you to discuss that with your case manager and see what they can do to help you with that. Because there's creative ways around everything. <coughs> Excuse me. So when they say yes, I want you to create an agenda with your purpose of the meeting and line items and email that to the case meeting. So everyone's on the same page and they know what to expect. So it could be a very fruitful meeting. 
Request the staff who are involved in your case to be present, which is a very important thing. Just like a regular PPT meeting you would have at the school, this is the same thing. Next slide. So there's several types of PPT meetings happening now. Virtual over the phone or the computer, um, over the computer or the smartphone. The telephone, you can call in. There are no in-person meetings currently happening in Connecticut and pretty much anywhere in the United States. Next slide. So here's some things that I saw some comments that come through. I know PPT meetings are happening in some districts and some are not having PPT meetings. So some are saying no to all meetings and some are saying yes to essential meetings. And you know, I think one of the most important things is to ask what's the definition of essential, essential PPT meeting and it can meet the criteria. And don't be intimidated if they say no at first. Just do your proper going up the chain and documenting everything. And I want you also to stay in close contact over email with teachers and case managers. Next slide. There's a hand raised, Kevin. I don't know if you see it. Yes, and I'm going to save it for after. Oh, okay. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So the second part of this, and I want to make this kind of zoom through this because I know we want to get to Brian, but this is week five for us here at Mommy School. And what I learned this week, what differential, differentiated instruction really looks like at home, and I'm pretty much doing whatever it takes to get the job done. So I pretty much bribe my children to do the work, and it's kind of the odd box thinking. Environmental control came into play this week a lot, and I learned a lot from our special ed teachers from the schools that my children go to. And it was pretty much shutting the curtains and closing the windows because someone was mowing along the side. And it was just really hard. So I learned a lot about that this week. And above all, I think as parents, excuse me, you know your children the best. And my kids needed a break. By Friday, they were burnt out. So we only did a couple things in the morning. We kind of just, it's not that we were blowing off the rest of the day, but I could tell that they needed a break. So we took a break. And only you can judge that and you have to trust your gut on that one. Next slide. So I wanted to share a picture of what differentiated instruction looks like here at my house. Um, my kids wanted to put on Halloween costumes <laughs> in order to get them to read. I was like, sure, you can go do that, but you still have to read. And so they did. And lo and behold, they sat there for an hour and read together, which is like a win on so many levels. So again, I'm doing whatever it takes to have them to read. I'm following, I'm following their lead, which I think is a very important methodology for all parents. You have to follow, you have to stop and approach it from a different angle because there, there has to be a, way, a different way to do it. A plan A and a plan B and a plan C. Next slide. So environmental control, I'm sure some of you are already familiar with this, but when I did the things in my house, the attention to what we were teaching dramatically increased. And so my data shows that. And I also decreased my own frustration as mommy teacher and a student was happier because mommy was happier. Um, I also saw a cardboard cubby that someone used and so I'm definitely gonna try that. Like it was a piece of cardboard around the child with a chrome break. And it wasn't confined in any way, but it just helped increase the sensory overload. Next slide, please. It's okay to give them a break. It's a tremendous amount of stress on their fragile systems. Tremendous. You have to trust your gut and if you think something should be done differently, talk to the teacher. That's why they're there. Um, I think what I learned most about this week is to give them time to be kids. If they want to run around the house singing at the top of their lungs, wearing Halloween costumes, and at the end of the day they're reading, just let them be kids. They, they know what they need. Um, another really big thing I learned this week is addressing their fears and anxiety in very kid glove ways. Next slide, please. So every week I try to give you a silver lining. On week five, I, I understand it's hard, I get it. But the silver lining to every natural disaster is the opportunity for us to step forward and claim our inner strength and power and to choose to recover. So every morning I wake up and I decide that today is going to be a good day and I, I dig deep. So look deep inside and gather your inner strength to face your week. It's there, you just have to look and you will get through this. Thank you. 
Thank you, Audra. It's all you. It's all you, guys. Those are words to take with us. I appreciate that. Okay, and now we're going to go to my interview with Brian Klimkowitz. Brian is the director of the Bureau of Special Education at the Connecticut State Department of Education. Brian, welcome. I know this is a busy time for you. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate the invite. Uh, glad to be here and um, help, uh, ho hopeful uh, to provide some information uh, that will be helpful to the participants. Well, then let's go right into it. What has the Bureau been doing to keep parents of students with disabilities informed about this crisis and the many changes that are happening? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Kevin, if it's okay, um, I'd just like to start out with just a few words and then uh, I really appreciate the time that you took um, to put together that PowerPoint to lead off, but there were just a couple of points of clarification, if that's okay, uh, before we lead into the questions and, and maybe some of the questions uh, and answers will help as well. Um, and I know the executive orders, for example, are coming fast and furious, but I know that your slide mentioned April 20th as the delay and uh, that, you know, that's been extended to May 20th. Um, so, uh, you know, the school closures are extended even longer. Um, that was a typo on my part. I don't know how I missed that. <laughs> that that's okay. I just wanted to provide that clarification and I know uh, probably most of the participants are aware, and I know you're aware of that also, that that was just the, the most recent executive order. Yeah, and but then, uh, don't have your kids out at the bus stop on April 21st. That's okay. right. School buses. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, uh, regarding your slides around special education, um, the, the Jimmy Durante slide that you had, you know, that, that's, uh, that's certainly not the case, that, that special education is not happening during this time, and and that those requirements aren't in place. But um, I, if, if I could just start off, um, I can talk a little bit to answer your first question about what the Bureau has been engaged in. And, and first of all, to you and Audra and all the participants, you know, just wishing you health um, during this really difficult time. And um, uh, I know that it's been a very trying time for us all and that, that this pandemic has impacted us and it is, it's getting closer and closer and seems to be, um, you know, I guess we're experiencing the curve now, you know, over the next couple of weeks. So it's a very scary time. Um, and uh, we, we are sensitive to that fact. Uh, and, and today, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to discussing this very important issue around special education during this time. Uh, and, you know, I, just, just a quick mention, I'm really honored to be part of the team, the leadership team at the State Department of Education. Uh, Commissioner Cardona and Deputy Commissioners uh, Charlene Russell Tucker and Desi Nesmith. The, the team has been so supportive of uh, students with their challenges, students that are at risk, uh, special education students, uh, students on 504 plans, those that are um, uh, require supports and services to the general education population and it's really just been an honor to be part of that collaborative effort and uh, I'm thankful for the opportunities that I've had to discuss my concerns around around the uh, COVID-19 closures and as well as uh, you know ensuring that students and parents and stakeholders across the board uh, their voices are being heard during this time because it's very easy to feel isolated during this time. And as Audra said, you know, waking up every morning and saying the next day is going to be better. I think uh, Connecticut will be stronger uh, as a whole uh, when we uh, make it through this, uh, make it through this uh, health crisis. Uh, we, we know the reality is, is that uh, I, I love the title, Kevin, of, of this session as far as, you know, getting answers. And unfortunately, there's a lot of unanswered questions right now and information is changing rapidly. Um, part of uh, what I'll talk about today is you know, the idea of guidance that comes out both from the federal level and the state level is sort of a working document. In other words, you know, when, when we originally had school closures for the first weekend, uh, there was schools that were closed for a day or two for cleanings, and then that, of course, turned into two weeks, uh, the progression thereafter with the executive orders. 
So we've been working around the clock and trying to get ahead of and provide accurate and up-to-date information for educators and families. So we'll continue to work to do that uh, during this time. And, uh, you know, I, I just really appreciate the collaboration and the communication uh, that's happened up to this point in time. Uh, OSERS has provided us with a few documents, uh, some of which you highlighted. Uh, there was a March 12th question and answer, as well as March 16th uh, from the OCR and a follow-up supplemental document on March 21st. And those are all really important documents to help us navigate the, this new situation. From the Bureau, we, we've had three pieces of formal guidance that have come out as memorandums on March 24th uh, with a general um, special education update about continued educational opportunities. March 31st around uh, students that are placed in out of district programs and the responsibilities for those programs to provide continuing ed supports. And then most recently on April 3rd regarding our due process system. Um, so again, I wanna thank our partners in that those documents were definitely not uh, done in isolation, and uh, we received a lot of feedback prior to, during, and then after the release of those documents. And uh, again, as I mentioned, we know that they will need to be updated uh, as, as we need to shift our thinking to a temporary closure to more long-term closure. Um, I, you know, I want to thank our partners at CPAC. Uh, we have a couple of documents that have been um, disseminated around frequently asked questions for parents and a document to school districts about what parents need now. And this was based on interactions and feedback that CPAC has had with parents uh, within their, within their uh, phone calls and their outreach. We also did a collaborative webinar, which is recorded on our website, which I'm happy to share with uh, the participants on, it was the first of a parent series, just to uh, help parents understand that they're not alone within this process, that there are supports. Um, so we wanna make sure that that information gets disseminated. Um, our state advisory council has held a meeting during this time. Uh, it, obviously, it's a virtual format, but um, and it was truncated um, because we had to cancel our in-person meeting in March, but we're looking forward to more frequently getting impact, input and feedback from our state advisory council. And the RESC Alliance also has been uh, in, in CERC, our state educational resource center. They've just been essential partners in uh, helping the state department build our capacity to reach out and provide supports during this time. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot going on, as you mentioned, Kevin, you know, we've, we've been certainly busy to try to, uh, one, provide guidance, to provide information, to provide supports, and, and to understand the needs of parents and educators and students during this time. Um, so we, we've, uh, not, not the Bureau of Special Education, specifically, but, but the commissioner's department, um, and the commissioner's team has sent out surveys to superintendents to understand their needs around the continued educational opportunities. And um, that, that feedback, we, we receive feedback from all districts on where they are within the process of providing supports and services for students. Uh, and then within that, we're able to identify or districts are able to identify where support and technical assistance is needed. Uh, and of course that process takes some time, but uh, we're really moving quickly ahead with that. Um, so we, we, we know we don't have all the answers, um, but I, I have been encouraged by the positive activities that are happening. And I've also been really concerned with, uh, with some of the uh, input that we've received from some families um, and some districts. So, um, you know, we're, our job at the State Department is to try to assist with that and to assure, ensure that to the greatest extent that uh, consistency across districts um, can be implemented. I know that was a really long response to your first question, Kevin, so I promise I won't be as long-winded with the second, but I just wanted to mention those things and um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today.
try and take all the time you need to answer the questions. It, it's, it's very much appreciated. Now, the school districts over the last month have started doing things they've never done before. The Bureau also, you're doing things that you haven't done before because of this unprecedented situation. What kind of obstacles did you run into that you needed to overcome? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Kevin. I think, you know, j just personally, um, you know, it, it's uh, a different way to work. Uh, so, you know, we're, the State Department of Education is still open. Our building is still open, but 95% of our team is working from the home environment now, including myself from, for the last three and a half weeks or so. And so we're still able to come in as needed uh, there's still some essential activities that are happening in the uh, department, but for the most part, we're working remotely. So that was uh, not an obstacle necessarily, but just a new a new way of operating and a new form of operating. I think uh, over the last few weeks, I've become uh, more proficient. Still not uh, uh, a guru by any stretch of the imagination, but more proficient with technology as far as uh, meeting virtually and. Uh, disseminating information and collaborating with uh, teams within the department virtually. So those are some, um, I don't know if the obstacle's the right word, but definitely challenges in, in the way that we're, we've been operating. And you know, we, in this difficult time, you try to focus on the opportunities that are in front of you. I think uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's an important time to, um, to be in the position that we're in. Um, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, um, you know, moving forward uh, to, to think about things that we haven't in the past, you know. Um, so, you know, health and safety obviously taking precedent over everything else. You know, it's, we want to make sure that um, I know the, the State Department of Education has provided 1.5 million meals to students during this time. So that was the first obstacle is that, well, how do we reach out to the families in a, in a way that is safe and in a way that uh, maintains people's health, but still is able to provide supports and services. So I know, you know, there's concerns around that for, for those that are delivering those meals and providing those meals in schools. Um, so, you know, that, that health factor continues to be an obstacle in the way that we've operated in the past and the way that we need to be able to shift um, and learning new ways to to sort of navigate this new, hopefully temporary reality. Um, but again, I think um, there there are um, you know there are pockets of greatness that are happening during this time, and that's because of relationships. It's because of strong relationships that happen between schools and between parents and collaborative efforts to to support individuals. And I think, you know, the, the other obstacle that I'll mention during this time is not only the physical health of individuals, but also the mental health. And, and um, we're all dealing with, with this crisis uh, in different ways. And as I mentioned in the opening, it's, it's hitting us closer, uh, it seems like, on a daily basis. And families and students and educators are dealing with stress, anxiety, depression, um, and, and um, you know, a, a, a whole host of issues um, that are, are compounded by the fact that we're um, socially distance, distancing to uh, provide our safety. So again, we, you know, we're, we try not to focus on the obstacles, but Kevin, they're, they're obvious, and we're dealing with that per personally, I think, and professionally. So we always say in the morning, uh, you know, back to Audra's about this is going to be a great day, taking care of your own personal needs to make sure that you're able to do your job or support your family or, or both or all, all at once to try to find that balance. It's not always easy. And for parents these days, they're running into quite a few obstacles. First, there was the shock and awe of all the schools closing, all the businesses closing, all yeah. the tensions around the pandemic. And now parents are dealing with the shock and awe of taking on the role of educator, home educator for their child. For many parents of kids with disabilities, the demands of teaching their children are too much. They get stuck, they get overwhelmed. 
It's frustrating for both the parent and for the child. Brian, what would you say to a parent who is overwhelmed by the demands of schooling their child at home? Yeah, I, you know, I would first say, you know, I, I just, I, you know, I have three children of my own at home, so um, I, um, I, I know the, the, the challenges of, from the parent point of view. However, you know, I don't, my children you know, don't have um, intensive special needs. So that again compound situations for parents and families. I know the the struggles to be able to to balance uh, the the demands of continued educational opportunities and the health and happiness of your children and all of the anxieties that are compounded on that. But first of all, I would say to parents that you, just to know that you're not alone uh, in in what you're facing. Um, and you know, just just going back to what Audra said that. Connecticut's not unique in this situation. This is happening across the country where uh, all, all across the country, families are faced with similar situations. I think some states are being impacted more than others right now. Obviously in the Northeast, uh, we're really being hit hard with the, with the pandemic, but just know that you're not alone. Know that there is support out there. I think part of what our initial trainings tried to do uh, in our webinar, parent webinar series was just to help share information with parents about who they can reach out to during this time. You know, I think it's, it was great advice uh, given to communicate with your school. So let, let your teachers know, let your case managers know, let your principals know, whatever the vehicle or the format of communication is, to try to find that uh, perfect balance, if there is such a thing, about the amount of work uh, the amount of work that's able to be received um, and the amount of work and the amount of instruction that students are um, are capable of learning. You know, those basic needs need to be met. So um, yeah, families, parents, you know your children best. Uh, you, you know the days where you need to take a step back or where you need to incorporate those fun activities to try to keep um, you know, some sense of balance in, in our lives during this different time, difficult time. So yeah, ju just those three things, just know, know that there are supports out there, um, talk to families, connect with families as much as you can virtually, connect with your local schools and your teachers and your educators that hopefully know your students uh, throughout the course of the year and have gotten to know your students and uh, reach out to the State Department of Education if needed. We have two consultants that are just uh, devoted only to receiving parent phone calls and emails at this time. So, um, you know, know that, that if there is assistance that we can provide, we're willing in, in to do that. Um, and then, um, you know, be, being the parent, you're, you, the parent has always been the number one educator for their children. So that continues during this time. Um, so. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I, I agree that as parents, we are the natural educators for our children. Let's talk about planning and placement teams. This is a sure. very hot topic for parents right now. Some school districts, as you heard, are telling parents there will be no PPT meetings while schools are closed, or they will PPT in case of an emergency. Who decides what constitutes an emergency? Is it the school district? Yeah, so a couple things about the PPT process. So the requirements for planning and placement team meetings remain. So we, the, the, the requirements are in place. There's no waiver, there's no alleviation of these requirements by any means. So um, what, what we're, you know, it's, it concerns me what it, um, to hear if there are school districts that are sort of with a broad brush saying, PPTs are not being conducted until X, Y, or Z. So I think you know, both parents and schools have to be thoughtful and deliberate in how they make those decisions. Um, you know, I think we've, in our guidance document, have articulated some factors that both parents and schools should consider. And again, understanding that our guidance came out uh, you know, March 24th, uh, it needs to be updated frequently, uh, needs to be updated at this point. 
but number one is safety and, and security um, to, to ensure safety for all members. And um, there, there are no face-to-face -face PPTs happening now, that, that is accurate. All school districts and parents know that virtual PPTs can happen. Uh, we, we want districts and families to initially, when the school closings happen, to, to focus on communication efforts, to focus on transforming school buildings into virtual classrooms, in a sense, to work to implement and to discuss continuing education plans. Um, that, that takes time. Uh, that takes efforts that takes creativity for all staff members. Um, the PPT process, you know, it, once safety and, and confidentiality and privacy are considered, there's also meaningful participation. So we want districts and parents to be comfortable to, uh, within that virtual format, whether it's audio or whether it's done by video format. So I've heard from districts and from parents who have had very successful PPT meetings during the school closures. There was agreement, there was enough notice uh, provided for all participants. If a member of the PPT wasn't able to convene, a parent has the right in the school district to uh, waive that requirement and alleviate that team member's presence in the, in the meeting as long as it's uh, either not discussed or that their information is provided by someone else. So I think, you know, that I, again, I've heard very effective team meetings. Um, there, there's been students that, for example, have tra transferred from the hospital setting that required a change in placement that PPTs were being held. Um, so I think, you know, a, on a case by case basis, schools and parents should discuss the uh, purpose of the PPT and the meaningful participation. And, and just to add on the sort of on the flip end of what I described for that best case scenario, the, uh, some parents have felt like they were being, for lack of a better word, forced to hold meetings because of compliance reasons. So in other words, Johnny's annual is due today, we're meeting today, you know, even if the parent was unable to either have the technology to participate, have the notice that they needed to prepare, or feel like they had the information that they needed for the purpose of that PPT. Uh, and I've also heard you know, so, uh, some of what was discussed earlier where schools are saying, we're not holding PPTs right now. So we, we want that message to be, uh, to be different. We, there, Parents should not be told, like I said, broad brush that PPT meetings are not being held. There should be thoughtful and deliberate conversations around that. And, um, and we, we do know that from OSERS that the, the, the development of continued educational opportunities for students and that special education related services that are being implemented to the greatest extent possible that's not required to be in a PPT, uh, in an IEP, excuse me. It, it may be, but it's not required to be. So that allows parents and districts, again, open communication to be in frequent touch with what's being provided and, um, and to be able to document what's being provided during this time. So I, you know, I, I don't know how to answer the question about an emergency because that there, there's just a requirement, there continues to be a requirement to hold PPTs. Uh, OSEP doesn't have the authority to waive that requirement. The Bureau of Special Education doesn't have the authority to waive that requirement. But we do understand that the impact of this pandemic, uh, there's some um, practical limitations uh, to meeting some of those timeline requirements. As you mentioned, virtual PPT meetings are a distinct possibility. And yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if the next time any of us are in a PPT meeting, it will be a virtual PPT meeting. When that happens, when parents are attending at distance, what should school districts do to ensure that parents are fully included in the meeting and in the decision-making process? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I, I hate to keep saying communication, 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 but really that's the foundation of any successful meeting, I believe. You know, the, the best uh, PPTs are the ones where there's no surprises on either end, either from the parent's perspective or the school's perspective, because the parent and the school and the team have been in consistent communication throughout the year. If you're waiting for a meeting to be able to discuss, um, you know, concerns and you haven't had good communication leading up to that, that poses uh, difficulties. And, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to chair thousands of PPT meetings uh, in my past experience as a, as a administrator and a director and a teacher and a peer professional prior to that. And, you know, the, 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 the art of facilitation is that it, it is an art to ensure that all members are meaningfully participating. Um, I think, you know, the use of an agenda, for example, uh, goes a long way. Uh, again, art, clearly articulating people's roles within the meeting. Uh, I think meet PPTs can be challenging in person and face to face and, and um, that we all know. And I think virtual you poses is, is even more challenging potentially to that, especially by phone. Uh, back to just my experience as a director, I, I've participated in uh, several meetings by phone without being there with the team. And I found that personally particularly challenging to, to be able to focus on the information that's being delivered, spoken, um, it's, it's, you have to, um, it, it takes a different level of, of um, awareness, I guess, for lack of a better word, to be able to receive that information, take that information in, and then participate meaningfully, uh, meaningfully from that. Um, so I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's talking to uh, the parent, talking to the PPT members, asking them what their level of comfort is within the, the format that is being used and and like all, everyone else just getting used to it getting you know getting used to the format getting used to the uh, working out the technical issues making sure that everybody can be heard and um, that decisions can be made in the best interest of students so uh, meetings that are being held uh, I think uh, like I said there have been some very successful meetings that I've heard from there's been meetings that have attempted to meet and have had failed attempts because of technology or because of the difficulty in trying to get through the content of the meeting. Um, and then, um, you know, I think what, what we want to be able to do at the State Department is to support that process, understanding now that we're out through April 20th and then again the delay through May 20th mm -hmm. uh, and, and even potentially beyond that. Um, what, you know, what are some best practice strategies for successful virtual meetings? What does that look like? How have they, um, how have they happened? What information is shared? Um, you know, an, another concern, Kevin, just, you know, you talked about meaningful participation, the ability for parents to see or to, for example, if you're sitting at a table and uh, teachers are able to share a document uh, and make six copies and everybody gets a copy and is able to look at that same document that that has to be considered within the virtual format is that document shared prior to is it shared electronically with the parent is it um, you know do, do all of the members have the same information at their separate locations where they're participating virtually so <clears throat> you know we, we don't have all of the answers about virtual PPT meetings because this opportunity was thrust upon us, I'll say, but I know that uh, districts are being creative, parents are being creative and working together, I'm confident that we will be able to increase the amount of successful PPTs that are being held virtually. Well, it sounds like it's a matter of getting used to things and taking steps we're not used to taking and adjusting. And there's a lot of that going on right now in pretty much all aspects of life. A little, a little more about PPT meetings. Spring sure. is the season when PPT teams typically make important decisions about the coming school year. Decisions like placement, transition, programming. 
if schools don't reopen until the fall, how can these dis decisions be made if there are no PPT meetings or if they're done virtually? Is there enough time to do that? Is there capacity to do that before school starts? Or will we be in a position where these important decisions, at least for some students, will not have been made by the time school starts in the fall? Yeah, I think, you know, that that um, question and that fear, I think, is real, Kevin. You know, the, this is a time where most of the annual reviews do happen across the state. And, uh, you know, the, there's a reason for that. This is a very important and critical time for all students, really. I think you know, guidance just recently came out from the commissioner's office around grading and uh, graduation and attendance. And I, I think you know, that, that helps set the foundation for uh, students with IEPs because we know students with IEPs are general education students first. So th these decisions need to be made and have to be made um, and they, they have to be done through the PPT process. There, there's uh, no alternative means. Again, I think, you know, o what OSERS has said thus far is that parents and school districts to, can come to an agreement to delay some of those timeline requirements. So I think that's important to keep in mind that um, it, it's not a unilateral decision one way or another. I know we've been collaborating and getting input from stakeholders about some of these processes. Uh, for example, students that transition to the technical high school system. Typically, this is the time where PPTs would get together and review the IEP and then discuss that transition to that new environment. Th those meetings need to happen. Um, we need to be prepared for the transition. And we're, you know, we're working with stakeholders through some of these questions. Our updated guidance will help address some of these areas, I think, around the PPT process. Uh, I'm, I don't think, I'm, I'm confident that they will. Uh, I, th I know that OSERS and OSA have some topic briefs that are ready to be released. I was told that this week they will be released and one of the topic briefs will include information about IEP team meetings, which we call our PPTs in Connecticut. So the, you know, the information will be coming forth uh, because there are legitimate concerns and questions about how to conduct these types of meetings uh, that you mentioned, Kevin, with transitions and with uh, moving from one grade to the next and, and trying to determine progress during this time yeah, um, those are all cha challenges uh, given the current situation. They certainly are. Now, when uh, the parents of a special education student disagree with their child's PPT team, yeah. they have the right to the, use the Bureau's dispute resolution process to resolve the problem. For example, parents can file a complaint with the Bureau. They can request a mediation hearing. They can even have a formal due process hearing. How has this crisis we're in affected the Bureau's dispute resolution process? Is it still working? Yeah, uh, so our, our latest document re released um, on April 2nd re uh, updated information about our due process activities. Our due process unit is open and operational even though we're working remotely. So we're asking parents and school districts to the extent that they are able to communicate with us electronically. We do still have essential employees within the due process unit working from time to time in the building. We're able to check our voicemail uh, uh, virtually. So our, we, we have been and continue to receive formal complaints and we are working on those complaints and processing the complaints. There, we understand there are some limitations perhaps to timelines. For example, if um, districts aren't able to access certain information or files because they're not able to get into the buildings or access the information that's needed, that, that poses a little bit of difficulty. Our mediation, um, we, we are still receiving mediation requests and the Bureau is looking into and um, close to a solution regarding virtual mediations that will be happening in the future. So uh, we, we've taken steps to train our mediators and looking into training our mediators and looking for a platform that will work to continue those activities and due process requests are still being uh, accepted, processed. Uh, and again, there's some logistical uh, 
imp there's a logistical impact to some of the steps and some of the components within the due process hearings. Um, but our pre-conference hearings, for example, can happen by telephone. There are extensions that the hearing officer can uh, provide to the parent and the school district as they're working through some of those disputes. I see. Now, a different kind of disagreement. Parents who yeah. disagree with a school evaluation their school has provided, they have the right to request an independent educational evaluation, also known as an IEE. And, and parents out there, I'd like to point out that um, this is a right to request an independent evaluation. It's not necessarily yours for the asking. So it's a good idea to do research and see how the process works before you ask for an independent evaluation. Uh, like I said, it's not yours just for the asking. But during this crisis, while schools are closed, how should school districts respond to a parent's request for an independent evaluation? Yeah, we have some really nice resources around independent educational evaluations at public expense. Um, that you know that right parent right as you mentioned is still in place. Uh, Audra mentioned you know the face the face to face meetings aren't happening. Similarly, face to face evaluations are not happening at this time, so the timing is obviously very, very tricky. Um, I, I'm not sure parents would be able to access evaluations um, as we knew them previously uh, during this time of uh, stay at home, stay put but the districts have a responsibility to respond without unnecessary delay. And we know that this pandemic could provide, um, could provide barriers to responding uh, without delay, uh, in other words. So uh, that right still does exist. Um, and it, it's just a matter of working, uh, working through the process, as you mentioned, and understanding the process uh, and, you know, with, with regard to evaluations, again, we're working with stakeholders to determine, um, you know, within a comprehensive evaluation, what components or aspects can be done virtually, what components and aspects shouldn't be done virtually or, or provide um, difficulties to be able to work through. So uh, we are still receiving input and getting information along those lines because we know how important evaluations are to informing the IEP so that students can be successful. Yeah, this is an area that has not been explored before. So it will yeah. be interesting to see how things shake out. I know my guest for next week, week Dr. Smaller, the clinical psychologist, she has some very strong opinions on this subject. And yeah. um, please come back next week to hear them. I have another question, and it's about ESY, yes. extended school year, also known as summer programs for special education students. If schools are closed through September, will school districts be able to provide summer programs to special education students who need them? Yeah, this is another one of those unknowns, Kevin, I think because of the, uh, we, we, we're not sure where we will be with regard to the pandemic during the summer months. Uh, we, you know, we have that March, that May 20th deadline at this point that, that may be extended, again, depending on uh, the information that the Department of Health has and uh, the governor's uh, office has and you know, working with the State Department of Education. Uh, just a couple of points on ESY that I think are important. Those ESY determinations uh, are for individual students are still required. So, so that's something, again, that we're looking to provide more guidance for uh, in our upcoming and updated guidance document. OSER, OSEPT has been pretty clear about the fact that ESY should not, is not the same thing as makeup services for the impact of this not being in school. So th those should be, are two distinct and separate processes and shouldn't be connected. In other words, uh, you know, just a really quick example, a student may not qualify for extended school year services, but a school district still could provide makeup services in the summer based on the impact of the school, that, that the school closures um, once the PPT determines that impact. 
So I think uh, schools need to be creative and, and educators need to be creative and parents as well um, to, to utilize the summer months differently than we ever have before because of what parents and students and educators are, are going through now with the distance learning. So as you mentioned, schools are able to close on the last day whenever they had planned for that to be the last day of school. Uh, that will be at the end of the school year for this year. Um, and you know, we're already thinking about and trying, again, trying to be creative about opportunities that can be provided to students over those summer months. Well, that's good to know. It sounds like there are still a lot of things that are undecided. Now, for students who are seniors in high school, and I, I have this question, I also noticed it in the chat questions. That yeah. Is, will a senior, high school senior, be able to graduate this year? Yeah, they're, they're uh, so graduation is a, a local, a local decision on how that happens. Kevin, I mentioned the State Department of Education just recently released a document, updated memorandum around graduation requirements. Uh, that it's very important that the graduation, that students are recognized for their um, accomplishments and, and the need to do that, whether it be virtually or postponing those activities, but holding those graduations. Um, there's within that document also there was information about grading and um, you know, being able to assess students. Um, I think you know in one of your slides earlier, there's uh, the, the statewide assessments that uh, that are provided typically in March and April uh, were waived for all students. So students did not take SATs, for example, and PSATs in our smarter balance assessments or for students that are require it, our Connecticut alternate assessment. So, um, you know, so th those activities did not happen, um, but uh, I think, you know, for the purposes of our audience, when, um, as you mentioned from the federal guidance, when schools reopen in the sense where the buildings are open and students are able to uh, return back to school, there needs to be determinations of how the impact uh, on the student's ability to meet their goals and objectives and any makeup services that are required will need to be, um, to be instituted. Not every special education student graduates after high school. Right. There are students who go on to a transition program that can last through age 21 if necessary. Yes. As time goes on while schools are closed, many of these students are going to age out without finishing their transition program. What will happen to these students? Yeah, so that we also have a guidance document, that, a topic brief that's coming out around students that are transition only. Those are students that receive, have met their academic requirements, but are working on transition services. So in the past, uh, the research that we've done um, indicates that the students, um, they're, they're, even though they're aged, they, they have turned 21 or met those requirements, the ability for the school district to provide and, and to, um, to institute those makeup services and supports based on the impact that the student uh, experienced during COVID-19, those are able to happen for those students. We're working closely with other adult agencies, uh, DDS, DEMAS, uh, ADS, which used to be the Bureau of Rehab Services, uh, around these questions um, because it's a it's a very coordinated set of activities that happen and take place when students transition from school responsibility to adult agencies and whether they're pursuing employment, continued education, community activities and community living, those um, the students progress toward the, that end still needs to be assessed by the PPT Again, and to make that determination of what the impact was. So, um, again, this is an this is another area, Kevin, where we haven't experienced this before. And I think that, that uh, I am 
uh, encouraged by the collaboration and the creative I'm able to meet um, with other state directors on a biweekly basis to talk through some of these issues that um, that really are unprecedented given the given the pandemic. So I can promise you that those students will not be forgotten; that they will be addressed um, both by their, you know, um, obviously those that care for the students and support them in the home environment, the schools that support those students in the transition programs. Um, and us at the State Department of Education uh, to ensure that, uh, that their processes as, as uh, much as we can uh, will be able to be supported and, and continue. Brian, I have one last question before we turn it over to Q&A with, uh, with our registrants. Uh, I'd like to look ahead into the future because at some point in the future, the country will open up public schools will be open again, things will go back to normal. Although it's going to be a new normal. That's one thing about normal, there's always a new normal. You know, what was normal a month ago isn't normal today, but what's normal today wasn't normal a year ago or 20 years ago. Normal is always evolving. So don't be put off by the fact that we are going to a new normal. But in this new normal, when we get to that point, what lessons will we have learned from this crisis that will make school districts better equipped to handle the next pandemic that comes along. Yeah, that's a that's a difficult question, Kevin, and really interesting. You know, I, um, <clears throat> you know, as a uh, as a school, I'm sure, and I, I don't mean to speak from the schools and the district's point of view, but you, you always try to prepare for every possible scenario, and um, you know, um, I think. Just uh, the way this pandemic uh, hit us here in the state and in the country, I don't think uh, you know a month and a half ago, two months ago, if you mentioned this, um, it, just no one could have imagined that, that we would be experiencing this right now. So again, you know, I like I like the idea of ending with silver linings and ending with uh, hope. And uh, you know, like you said, Kevin, hopefully sooner rather than later, we're able to return back to school. Uh, as we knew it before. I think, you know, th three things I'll say, I think schools and districts will be uh, much more uh, prepared to provide supports and services virtually. So, you know, we're, they're working on that. I think those activities are increasing and improving on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, if you speak to an educator and they don't talk about continuous improvement, and they probably need to be in a different field because uh, no one is satisfied with the status quo. We, we always want to improve. We always want to get better. We always want better results for our students. Um, I think that this has, um, at least personally, it's, it's helped us understand what's important during a time in crisis. You know, the, your, your family, the, those that you love and care for, um, you know, the health and safety of, of our kids, our students, and, um, and our families and our communities, so important. Um, and working together and working collaboratively, I think we can overcome any obstacles, in, including this current challenge with the health crisis. So, you know, I, I think, you know, this, this pandemic has accelerated our state's ability to provide distance learning and it's accelerated um, you know it's it's parents have sort of been uh, like like you said th uh, thrust into being able to or, or being required to support students learning uh, in ways that they haven't been before so you know hopefully that that you know parents are able to take away some strategies that they've learned you know through, through this time and apply those moving forward. Um, but, you know, I, I remain encouraged and hopeful and um, I, you know, I'm happy to hear the positive pockets of success that I mentioned earlier, but we know that our work um, is still ahead of us, you know, that, that there are still issues and concerns that need to be addressed right away. Uh, we try to keep consistent communication with uh, the our CONCASE, our special education directors, with our superintendents, 
uh, I think holding meetings like this virtually and, and discussing these issues is really important. So I, I hope those forms of communication remain when we do go back and that there's that consistent uh, collaborative effort uh, to address important issues moving forward. Well, that would be a great takeaway from this crisis. Let's get into questions from participants. I'm looking at one now. What options are available for Connecticut parents who ask for a remote PPT meeting by phone and continue to get denied by their school district? What would you say to that, Brian? Yeah, I could, uh, I'm happy to take that question, Kevin. I would say, you know, it, it sounds like that person or that parent may have reached out more than on more than one occasion. Um, I would say, you know, if, if uh, again, think about the purpose of the PPT meeting at that time, um, ask the school, you know, I think Audra mentioned earlier to write the request in an email, but if you're able to ask the school what their reason is be, uh, about not holding the PPT, I think that's important. I want parents to understand that they can reach out to CPAC and call them for support uh, to be able to help navigate that situation. Uh, as well as our Bureau, the Bureau of Special Education, to help navigate that situation and to speak with the parent to, um, and to potentially to intervene where needed. Excellent. Another question. What about grades? Is pass-fail going to be implemented? Yeah, if there, Kevin, I'm not sure if there's a way that I can share those resource documents with the participants today but there is a, a guidance document that just came out recently about grading and the different, uh, the different um, options for local school districts to be able to make those determinations. There is a pass-fail option. Uh, there is a, a pass-incomplete option. There is passing with distinction. The State Department of Education has been working really hand-in-hand -hand with higher education to uh, so that higher education, um, for example, students' transcripts are collected up to a certain point in time uh, prior to the school closures, um, and it doesn't negatively impact students that are transitioning on to post-secondary education. So um, it, it is a local decision. Uh, uh, grading is a local decision, but I think this guidance document really frames out the options that schools have with regard to grading during this time. A uh, second ago, you mentioned students who are transitioning out to post-secondary education. The next question that's coming from our participants is about students at the other end of the process. What information yeah. is there about the process of kids aging out of birth to three and transitioning into the school year, into, into the school system? Is, is that still going on? Yes, so that's a great, another great question. And I apologize for not mentioning that earlier. That is another topic. Uh, you know, we mentioned that we, probably one of our most frequently asked questions is around transition on both ends. One, the transition age, what happens for students 18 to 21? Mm -hmm. One that was just posed now. So there's a few different options. We, unfortunately, the Bureau of Special Education uh, needs help with this. So we do have language written uh, in collaboration with the Office of Early Childhood around birth to three services. Um, the transition meetings that are, uh, are happening virtually and school districts are required to participate in those transition meetings. Um, and then we have a guidance document that is going to be put forth um, to talk about the next step. So uh, typically, after the transition meeting, a planning and placement team meeting one or PPT one um, is held. At that meeting, the school district and the parent and the PPT uh, look at what, what would it constitute a comprehensive evaluation in order for that student to be determined eligible for special education or not. In some circumstances, school districts are able to utilize and teams are able to utilize evaluations that were already completed by birth to three in the Office of Early Childhood. And if there is enough information, uh, an eligibility determination could be made, for example, uh, and that student's um, IEP can be developed. 
And, um, you know, we, we know there have been families and students where uh, there, there has been, imp that, that, that process has been impacted. Some districts, for example, have reached out to families and, uh, you know, the most important thing is maintaining relationships and maintaining contact with those families that have been in birth to three. And unfortunately, the first interaction with the district is virtual, so, you know, it's difficult but we're encouraging districts to maintain consistent communication with those families, to see what their needs are, to see what pieces of the process can be done virtually. If there are additional evaluations that are necessary to make an accurate determination, uh, then those evaluations would have to be paused. But, um, but the supports that are be pro being provided to all students at that age should be considered uh, by the district and by the Office of Early Childhood. So again, I know that's a long-winded answer to, to a simple question, but um, we, we do have language that's being proposed as an executive order. The Office of Early Childhood has reached out to say that they are willing and able to expand birth to three services beyond the point at which a child turns three uh, during this interim time. And so that's, that's another option. We don't have that option formally at this point. There has to be approval, again, beyond the Bureau of Special Education and beyond the Office of Early Childhood. But uh, we, we've been, uh, this, this is certainly a priority for us because we know those students are really are uh, in a different category in that they don't have IEPs or they haven't been determined eligible for public services uh, up to this point. Uh, the, the next question I have for you is, is actually a comment from one participant and a question from another, but they are on, on related subjects. Okay. Uh, one participant reports that her school district in Northwest Connecticut has informed her that there will be no PPT meetings and they referenced guidance from the Bureau of Special Education as the reason. Um, and the question that is part of this is, will you send revised guidance that states that PPT needs to be held and that parents are allowed to, to make the request for a meeting. Given that parents are implementing the IEP, they should be answer. Kevin, I, so, so you, the last part of your question broke up there, but I, I did hear the most of the question in the comments. And you, you know, what I would say is if, if you know, they, I would have them reach out to the Bureau of Special Education because we could follow up with districts. You know, again, I think you know, initially in that first week or two or when schools were closed for the weekend, um, you know, that, that made sense um, to, to say that PPTs weren't happening at that time given the short-term uh, short nature of school closures. Uh, we do understand that there is an impact to holding PPTs, which we've talked about at length, but uh, I would say that the, our guidance that PPTs can't and shouldn't happen is not accurate. It's, it's not an accurate interpretation. And to answer the question about will our guidance be updated, yes, it will. Um, and then, you know, I think I think it's uh, it's necessary for open communication between parents and school districts at this time. We know that um, when teachers and PPT members are in team meetings, that's the time that they're not able to implement continuing education plans. Um, that that's the case when we have school when school is in session. So, um, you know, I, I would say to, to make us aware of that, again, work with your schools, work with your case managers, um, sort of work through the chain of command within your districts. If you're still unsuccessful and um, um, there's, you could reach out to the either CPAC or the Bureau of Special Education, and we're happy to follow up and uh, clarify any mis misconceptions. Excellent. We have time for one more question, Brian, and this is the kind of question where you're going to need to take out your crystal ball and look into the future and predict that Pennsylvania have closed for the rest of the year. Doesn't it seem likely that Connecticut will be taking the same step? What do you think? Yeah, so you broke up a little bit, Kevin, but I'll repeat it back to you to make sure I heard it. They said they're saying Pennsylvania has closed for the full year. And will Connecticut follow suit? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, I think, you know, that that uh, is still yet to be determined, uh, you know, from, uh, I, I don't, I don't want it, my crystal ball, I want to save, you know, for, uh, for other, other purposes, but I mean, you know, we, we've, um, you know, the, the, the extensions of time for school closures have expanded. These are decisions that are not made by me. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm not able to help predict that. I know it's a coordinated effort from the governor's office, from the Department of Public Health. And um, I, I know what, I, what I've been told in leading up to these decisions is, uh, you know, what is the effectiveness of social distancing? What is the effectiveness of some of the measures that we're trying to take to protect uh, people's health? Uh, you know, and, and unfortunately, it seems like the the last couple weeks and, and the weeks in front of us are going to be uh, still yet the worst that we've seen. I, you know, I uh, we are losing members of the State Department and other organizations um, that are battling with COVID-19. And um, so, I, you know, I, I wish I could give that person a definitive answer, uh, but we, we are planning for all scenarios, Kevin. We're, we're planning for a scenario where schools will be back after May 20th. We're also planning for potential extended closures into the summer um, and, and who knows, even to the next school year. So I think that's part of our responsibility is to be able to plan for all scenarios and to help support schools in their reopening process and support students in there in getting back um, again to acclimate back to the school environment. We are focusing on that and when that happens, we just don't know at this point. That's right, we don't know. There are many answers out there that we still have to find. Yeah. And this webinar will continue to pursue those answers. We kind of have to, it's in the name of the webinar. So we will do that. <laughs> I hope you all can join us on Tuesday night, six o'clock next week, where my special guest will be Dr. Adrian Smaller. And I'd like to thank my two guests, Brian and Audra. Thank you very much, both of you. And everyone out there in Zoom land, thank you for watching. We hope to see you again soon. Good night. Thank you, Kevin. Bye, Audra. Take care, everyone.